CenturyLink. So I'm an account executive, work with small and medium businesses for CenturyLink with IT consulting, cybersecurity, cloud communications, and telecommunications. Talking a little about telecommunications within Cincinnati market, how that's changed, how that's evolved, a little bit about CenturyLink, and then we have a referral program that for those in the IT, IT community, most notably that want to refer or make an introduction to me to their friends that have a need for a service we may provide. Um, we pay out for that, for that introduction should they choose uh, to go with CenturyLink if we find the right solution. Okay, um, so this slide is really, I guess, what's a timeline of what's happened most recently and how CenturyLink has acquired other companies to keep up with those evolutions. So 1930-2008, that's a bigger time frame than the other slides. Um, that was inter interesting. Um, so video, Blackberry, smartphones, um, CenturyTel was a rural telecommunications copper phone line, POTS line company and um, moved into the IP MPLS Ethernet space. So, so moving from a local telephone to a wide area network business enterprise company. Um, 2013, smart, more smartphones, bringer device, Internet of Things was early. I remember I was working with AT&T and I did a lot of Internet of Things projects, but that was, I think that was still pretty early before they started kicking off. Uh, social media, video, uh, essentially a product called Savas, which is a big hosting company. So bringing in disaster recovery, disaster recovery and service, uh, those the first time involved in cybersecurity. In 2014, I acquired a couple new companies as other SaaS and PaaS grown and uh, data analytics became more and more popular, and then cloud migration really became a focus of the company. Public cloud, hybrid, bare metal, whatever that may be. Um, and then 2016 to 17, uh, cyber attacks became at least more newsworthy, I'm sure, sure, sure you're all aware. Um, cloud application management, and then CenturyLink really acquired these other companies to become more of a digital transformation company to help enterprises and small mini businesses that want to go to a more digital business model help support that within the product portfolio via multi-cloud management or hybrid networks. And then last year, while I sit here today, is essentially acquired a company called Level 3 Communications last fall. Has anybody heard of Level 3 Communications? Okay. Has anybody heard of CenturyLink before? Okay, so even in, uh, a lot of times in the Cincinnati market, CenturyLink wasn't really a player. So second biggest telecommunications provider, um, but almost a new player in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Bell and Spectrum, your time under cables were really the main providers. Um, then after Level 3 acquired Time Warner Telecom, essentially acquired Level 3 Communications, and then they brought me on board to build a small medium business team. So we're uh, essentially a, a new player in the small medium business market in, in really Ohio and Kentucky, where we weren't a play before. Um, it, it, as far as your traditional internet service offerings and, and cloud, cloud computing is really pushed down to this small medium business space where we always play the enterprise space but not necessarily as much here. 
Okay. Um, I guess what the company is now. So it's a we are Big Bad Evil Telecom. <laughs> one of the most biggest and one of the baddest and one of the uh, <laughs> ones you've probably had experiences with as well. Um, so uh, what I'll take from this is this 100,000 on net buildings. It, it, does anyone know know what that means? Does that terminology mean anything to anybody? Okay. When we say on net, it means fibers built to the building already. So for instance, in Ohio and Kentucky, there are about a thousand what we call on net multi-tenant buildings, meaning there are multiple tenants within that building and fibers are already there, so we're already, already the local provider, which means a fast turn up time and much lower cost for internet providers. So for instance, uh, to Essentially, like we're providing one gigabit internet circuit to this location, it would be three grand a month. In a fiber lit building, it's four hundred dollars a month. So, a lot of my business is building on those on net locations. I'm always a low cost option and can provide a tier one internet connection with symmetrical upload and download speeds. Where it's something that level three communications never targeted the SMB market, so that's why uh, I'm playing my role in this market. Okay, um, that's a picture of the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Australia's on the wrong side for some reason. And Australia was on the right side. Um, so this is the fiber mile, so it just, just reinforces it being a national or international IP backbone and can handle the international customers. Um, this, uh, I won't read this slide, but it just really reinforces the 75% of CenturyLink's business is working with businesses, small, medium, and enterprise. There is still that legacy landline telephone in certain parts of certain parts of the country, but it's, the company's taking a direction to really focus on helping digital transformation and helping so solve. What, what is your core business? Core business. It's uh, telecommunication. Voice and data, or what is core business of Century? Um, because I, I, you're joking, Yeah, no, no, that's a good know. question. Um, yeah, so it, it, if I were to say CenturyLink overall, is what their core business is today would be voice and data. So I would you, say, you, you're trying to compete with major players in Cincinnati area, like uh, CBS, Cable or spectrum, that's what you're trying to enter in competition with them. Yes, I would, I would agree with that. Um, those would be the, the, the main uh, competitors on, on the telecommunication side. Really, Ryan McDonald's business is sit down with someone, and figure out how they're trying to leverage technology and tie that to business goals. If we have a, a solution within our portfolio, which is a large portfolio, so I won't, I'll, I'll let to solve it. Or if it's not, I'll let to make a recommendation to a friend that could not solve that problem. On the, on the um, national level or uh, oh. state level, uh, how, how will you compare as far as portion of the business? What, what portion of the business uh, you compare, uh, compare comparatively to major players? Uh, uh, good question. So essentially it's the second biggest telecommunications provider in America. And, and we have no, the number one in terms of Ethernet ports. So no one does dedicated internet world. you yourself to us first? AT&T's first. <coughs> so it, you deliver over what used to be the telephone system? When you say the telephone system, what do you mean by the that? The media that you're delivering IP services on is the fiber and copper that you typically think of as the phone company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, it, it, it's unique in that that the level three network in this area is we aren't the de facto ILAC or phone company, more of a it, but another provider with network in the area. If it's for instance we don't have fiber in the ground, we can still have to negotiate an agreement with the Cincinnati Bell or Spectrum. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. So as long as, it, as long as there is media to the location already, you can work with us, or we can work with you. Yes. So like a new construction where there's no infrastructure in place, depends on what's going to be there. Um, it, it depends on what's going to be there. 
Okay, so you can provide the fiber to the building if needed. Correct. It, it, okay. it, in, in a new build, if there's a brand new building, we might be hopping on Cincinnati Bell or, or Spectrum's fiber for what we call the local loop or last mile. Okay. And then from then on, it would be on CenturyLink's IP backbone. Got it. All right. Yeah, no, that, that makes it clear because I did have a new construction a couple of years ago with one of my clients and mm -hmm. they had issues. So. Yeah, I, I, I know that can be a challenge because a lot of the telecom systems are based on what address is, exists. And if the address doesn't exist from the post office yet, I know that can delay things and gum things up. So, so, uh, I've heard that story before. I, I've heard that story. Um, so let's talk a little about digital transformation. So it's, I know it's a buzzword, something we're hearing more and more, and it's not my slide. I'll just go that far. Um, but just as we're evolving, essentially as a company now, small and medium businesses are evolving. It started the enterprise where GE was a manufacturing company, now they're a digital company. Ford was a car company, now they're moving to a transportation company with connected cars. And it's not just at that level, but pushing it all, all the way down to the small and medium business level. I thought this would be maybe a place for some a, a discussion if anyone had a strong, I have a few uh, technologies that are changing, things that are happening, if anybody had any positive, negative opinions on any of these. Just feel free to jump in if, if you have. Yeah, the blockchain, uh, we learned about it last month with, with my friend Troy. I, I, I like that presentation. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I sat, I sat down with him a few months back, and he said he was giving this presentation for looking for a place to speak. I'm like, I know the room for that. So it, 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 any feedback for, it, for him, I, I'd love to go to him as well. What's the statement up there? Clouds just to the edge. Um, one trend that I guess I have done more work with is what's called network function virtualization. It, it, so what network, I guess the way I like to explain network fun, function virtualization is, you remember how you had a, a Gartner GPS in your car? And it had the maps and you put in the map where you want to go. Then everybody got iPhones. Then everybody got Google Maps on their phone. So now you download a software. You download the Maps app from the App Store. You don't have to get a CD and plug in Gartner, a new piece of equipment into your car, because it, it's in your phone. Network functionalization, network function virtualization is with a router or a WAN accelerator or a firewall. You have one white box on the edge of your environment, and if you need an updated version of that, you just update it. Or if, or if there's an application you only need for a certain period of time, you download it. Once you're done with it, you delete it instead of buying something new every time, like, like a, buying a new Gartner piece of equipment, just an app from the app store. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's hacking by if it's not, that was scary. Consciousness hacking? Yeah, consciousness hacking. Mm -hmm. I remember we're all dead before that. Um, it, it, and this is a slide. This is from Gartner. Some of their, some of their predictions, which I, I don't necessarily know that I I agree with some of them. But I don't have a crystal ball. Maybe maybe somebody else does. It, I did do some reading on the where it says AI real or fit counterfeit reality of making. Supposedly they'll be able to make videos or pictures, or. They'll be able to replicate your voice and put that in that. So let's say you, someone can, you can just create a video of you killing someone, but they'll be able to use your voice and your movements and your likeness. So how do we know if that's real? How do we know if that's counterfeit? So I, I don't know how we fix that, but that's uh, one thing I'm interested in. And then the 95% of products containing IoT. Is, does everybody know what IoT is? Is, is that a thing? Yep, pass it. That seems like a lot. Like I understand internet connected toasters, but internet connected erasers or internet connected trash cans. I guess I can see trash cans. Or posters. I mean, it, just with all the consumer products that exist in the world, 95% seems like a lot.
and then there was uh, IoT security spending on, on, on remediation. So, so uh, I know Internet of Things has been a security concern of many, but it's almost like we're waiting for something we expect, or they expect something to, to go wrong, and that's how we'll fix it. There won't be anything ahead of time. So a lot of this talks about the, how consumers or customers that are pursuing that digital transformation, like the G's uh, we talked about or are doing before, and how that's filtering down. So we want to be improve our efficiency, and we're using data more and more to improve decision making with data and with AI. We want to improve our internal and external customer experience. The priority is improved traffic and touch points, in-store call center, website, mobile. That's always been the case, but it seems to be growing. We've been more agile, so we're modernizing IT, our infrastructure. Everybody wants to go faster, more resilient, more secure. And managing business risk and, and, and securing customer data. Yeah, Ryan, you know, one of the things uh, I've seen as we progress with automation and these intelligence systems, you know, they talk about better customer, uh, you know, helping. But the problem is we've actually gone backwards because what we've done is uh, we've hit uh, all these call centers and everything. They go through a limited set of uh, choices and uh, therefore there's a lot of frustration from customers that just basically give up on uh, these things. It's, I've heard some criticism that uh, the whole idea is customer has a problem. We're just going to make them so frustrated that uh, they're just going to not pursue it any further. Yeah, you know, that's why I do. Where they're saying it's an intelligent handling, a lot of times I don't find very much intelligence in the handling of uh, you know what they do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've always worked for telecom companies, and I, I know I've been, in, I call it the black hole of the dialing the one eight hundred number and, and trying to press one, press two to get to the right department. One thing I've heard and I've seen more and more is people fixing like opening tickets via web-based interface or people want to interact with a computer or a chat more often than they want to on the phone. If I think about the next generations, like how often do they talk on a phone versus text messaging or computer-based interaction. So, and then in an ideal world, nothing ever breaks. So a managed service fixes that problem. Or with AI, things are getting fixed before the end user knows it's broken. I find that more wishful thinking than reality. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, that's hopefully what the future is. Yeah, I, I know, but that's, I just wanted to point out that I found that actually in some respects, as far as customer service uh, is concerned, we're actually tend to go a little bit back. Yeah, we're back. I mean, I, we don't live in the future, we live in the land. Right. I think it depends on who, and I think it depends on how much thought they put into it. Right, but I mean, Amer I've always used Amer American Express. Okay. As an an absolute excellent example of how to do customer service. Right, but not everybody's based on okay. But I not mean, everybody's American. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, we there, there'd be you know a whole different world out there. But yeah, I mean there are some companies that certainly went down road. Um, what I've been seeing is a lot of people are very confused about how to make it work at all. Yeah. Honestly. And you know we're leaving a lot of people behind because not everybody uh, has technology on their side versus assuming there's still millions of people out there that are just trying to, you know, eking out a sustenance living. And uh, we proceed as if uh, everybody's going to be able to use technology to solve their problems, which is not really, you know, valid as far as, you know, I'm concerned. This is just my perspective, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm, but, you know, implementation is a, you know, a very important thing. But my problem is, is how much do they really test these things? They, what you do is you have these programmers go out and say, here it is, you know, this, this should be easy to use and whatever. But uh, do they really do uh, the type of uh, testing that Microsoft did in the early days of their uh, working their Windows interface? I think that's, uh, that's largely been lost in the uh, process of saving money because it takes a lot of extra funds to do research. Research and development uh, has really been you know, lacking in, uh, in our society. Yeah. So anyway, uh, basically, uh, you know, it's, I'm just saying it's, a lot of this stuff seems more like wishful thinking. We're going to have AI take over things, and now we're going to have a more efficient way of handling stuff and things like that. But is this really going to happen in reality? 
if we're not paying attention to how we're actually implementing it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We'll find out. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting point because if we're executing poorly now, then we slap AI on it for what we're doing poorly now. Well, I don't know if you're intelligent, so you don't know what intelligence is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, for somebody smarter than me. Um, so, I guess it, it back to the question of where CenturyLink plays and from a solution offering. So, connectivity, be it that internet connectivity, hybrid IT in cloud, be it consulting, or we have a co-location facility in Columbus, or we sell Azure, AWS, uh, CenturyLink cloud as well, and can build this all in one platform. Uh, security, be it network security, so if it's a firewall in the cloud, or you need a CISO for a project, or uh, another staffing type issue or challenge. Uh, voice and unified communications, so your basic landline all the way to a call center. So hosting a call center, be it through a Cisco or Shortel Mindtel platform, or through Broadsoft. And then manage and IT services. So we do some work with SAP, uh, IT staff I mentioned, so not necessarily a true body shop per se. Uh, we do do some of that, but if it's a specific need, we've got a large team of consultants that either we can do contract to hire or uh, just on a project basis. Um, and this, this is the, I guess, general offerings. Um, one that I'm seeing a lot more in the small, medium business space is SD-WAN. Is, is anybody familiar with that technology? Okay, well, SD WANs on the newer side, it's, it may replace MPLS for a lot of small, medium businesses. MPLS being a wider network technology that will probably be around a while longer, but SD WANs a very cost effective way to, I guess, get the most of what you're already paying for and connect multiple locations. And we do that through a managed Meraki, Cisco Meraki platform or Versa MPLS, as I mentioned. Um, hybrid wide area networking, so broadband ag aggregation, so you can come, to, if, if a company had, let's say, 10 retail locations and they didn't need dedicated internet, they just needed a broadband, cheap broadband connection, we can be the one sole provider and get broadband pricing from the Spectrums, the Comcast, the local mom and pop cable shops all over the country. Or wireless backup, a, a pop of Verizon wireless SIM card in a device that and have failover. And just have to recover. If your main primary internet connection goes down, you're always connected. Internet, Ethernet, wavelength, dark truck, part line. What is dark fiber? Um, dark fiber I've never worked with, but You've never it, killed, so that's why it's I'm... it's more of a wholesale play. So not necessarily in the small medium. It, so it's fiber in the ground that no one's ever done anything with. So it almost gets sound like an infrastructure. So so my knowledge of dark fiber is pretty limited, just notice this. Yeah, I, I understand it to mean the excess capacity that fiber provides is not being used. I would say it's a better definition. Um, <coughs> content delivery networks are it's something I've worked with, with a partner called Akamai. So it's a way to make websites perform and use usability better. I worked with a company called uh, JEGS. They, you've probably seen Guys with rednecks wear yellow hats where, I'm, where I was from. They sold like auto parts, and we made their website interact in a way to in increase conversion rates, increase security. Uh, business Wi-Fi is a, it, something gross. It's something that we've seen some growth in. So managing Wi-Fi networks, so we know what's wrong, and they're easier to deploy, and we do the heat mapping for a warehouse type environment. Uh, Cloud, so if, if there's a cloud project, uh, we can typically play in that space. Uh, some of the integrated solutions, big data to service, um, play in the Internet of Things space, not necessarily the wireless cards, but consulting and connecting that to a wide area network. Uh, a co-location facility in Columbus is the closest location for someone that needs colo. Our uh, voice over PB is a broad soft platform. Collaboration, that traditional voice. Uh, security, uh, so a log, a log monitoring platform, incident response management, DDoS mitigation, but 
proactive, re reactive, or firewalls that are next gen or managed or co managed. And then the managed service piece. This would be like if there was a weird digital transformation project within a business, they just, the business needed something, just a specific project, needed consulting or people to help out with something, we would, we would be able to provide that as well. And um, I guess next we move on to our business referral program. So this is for, I guess, anyone that just, I guess, knows of an IT challenge or telecom challenge that's willing to make an introduction to me. We would, if that customer were to choose to go with CenturyLink, uh, we would pay you off for the introduction. And for me, just that sort of introduction, that's, that means a lot. That's something I, I would take as a personal thing to make sure we're finding the, the right solution <coughs> over and above and that they're taken care of. Um, so here's the website where you can register um, if you wanted to visit and send and send a referral or see the terms and conditions. So how it works out from a costing standpoint is let's say you referred someone to me and let's say they were spending a thousand dollars in an internet connection. We would pay you a thousand dollars. They're paying a thousand dollars a month. So whatever that monthly recurring revenue is, is what we would pay you on a referral basis. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, or if you're in a consulting environment where you wouldn't feel right taking a, I guess, a payment from, from the provider since you're, you, you want to seem like you're not favoring anyone, you could also make a donation that amount to a charity. It's right through the system. Uh, terms and conditions, it's, you, you read through a page and you're done. It's not a channel relationship where you have to do a certain amount or anything like that. It's, pretty, it, it's a simple, hey, hey, thanks for the introduction. Um, so that's, I guess, the other part I mentioned in the referral program is, I guess, what, what does a referral look like? Um, if you knew of a business that was having a challenge with the Cincinnati Bells or the Spectrum Timer or Cables of the World, and wanted to look at a different option, or if they say, hey, I think I'm billing a lot for my telecommunication services. Hey, hey Ryan, we take a look at this. I'd be able to tell them, what you have right now is pretty good, that's the best bet for you. If you're spending under $200 a month, I'm not a good option. If you have a couple locations, or you're making an IT change, or you're spending over $1,000 a month, I might, be, I might be a pretty good option for them. It, but at least it gives them the peace of mind of knowing what I have is good or not good. Can you can you look at what they're getting now and do a comparative pricing analysis? Yes. It's, it's, so for instance, it, I, I would look at their bill and if, if I had an idea of their number of users and what their current experience was today, I, I would be willing to offer that like a free service. Like for instance, I could look at a Cincinnati Bell bill and, and say you're spending too much on these analog lines. Call Cincinnati Bell, sign a one-year term, reduce your cost. So it just as a value add to an IT consultant type, that's something I'm willing, that's something I'm willing to help with. No, I, I meant more as present as in, you know, look at what uh, Cincinnati Bell or, or at and is providing my client, mm -hmm. and then say, well, we can do it for X amount. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so let's say they're spending that $1,000 since Danny Bell for a 10 megabit dedicated circuit with a couple of voice lines. Whatever they're getting, you can provide it for 850. Correct. It, uh, that would, it, I guess that would be a perfect example of what it, what it leverage this program and be something be something simplistic. So you're suggesting that you will beat uh, any deal of uh, my clients can no. Sound like this. Um, it, 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 if I was less, I would recommend it, or if I was more, I would tell you I was more. So if it's at Cincinnati Bell bills a thousand dollars and I'm twelve hundred based on the locations, I would say I'm twelve hundred for the same service. So a lot of ours is a lot of telecoms ge geographic based. So because you got to build, a, if if you're way out in the country, only one provider might only build only build to there, or no providers in some cases. Where they're still running copper T1s, and like you'll see them spending 600 bucks for 
copper T1 where you can get a gig fiber for 500 bucks. Yeah. In Michigan's a tough market. I had I, I had a few customers that had locations and that were rural in Michigan. It's it's tough for telecom. Does Century Link still support rural installations? Well, you said you started out in rural. Um, yeah, so it, like for instance, Lebanon and parts of Mason are the old Century Tel telephone company, where Cincinnati Bell is in the local provider CenturyLink is, or Marysville CenturyLink is the local provider in parts of Indiana, right. or a, 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 still the core of the what we call ILEC territory is Western United States, I mean, just different pockets through different acquisitions all over the country. Okay. Um, I guess future, um, we're having a drill event for if, if you want to learn about Wi-Fi and managed Wi-Fi and how to set Wi-Fi up in minutes, um, let me know if, if you want an invite to this. Uh, one lucky attendant, 16 foot inflatable outdoor projector, movie screen. Wow. wow. <laughs> it's like a, like a balloon. <coughs> when is it? It is 523, 10 a.m. CDT. That's 11 a.m. here. 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, it, it, it through Spiceworks, which you guys might know. <laughs> but primarily, it's Meraki folks. Are, are, are you guys familiar with Meraki? Used it? Yeah. And then another event. Coincidentally, also with the Cisco team in Cincinnati, uh, CenturyLink, we're very aligned with the Cisco team. Um, we, do, we do a fair amount of work together, and that's growing. Um, we're going to have one of our engineers, senior engineers, fly in, and one of the engineering managers from Cisco um, will have a SD WAN. What is it? How can we leverage it in Meraki? Uh, talk as well. Um, that's about all I had. Uh, here's some maps of just some of the, the fiber mileage and just the scope of the company and more in depth. Services not available in some areas. Services not available in some areas. <laughs> <laughs> you have to share that part. <laughs> If someone's in a two, three-year contract, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense to wait. If for telecommunications, if, if you've got a year left, that's when it probably makes sense to start looking. Uh -huh. um, I mean, obviously, if you have a ten-site MPLS network, it's different than if you have three phone lines. I mean, uh -huh. From a timing aspect. Under which condition would you you buy out? Um. If there was under a year left, and there was more than one site, or if it was in one of those pre-built buildings, pre-built fiber buildings. And or 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 or. You know, the pre-built fiber buildings, the ones where you, I, essentially you have the fiber straight to the curve of that building. Mm -hmm. That's your fiber, I'm assuming. Correct. Does that mean it's, you are the primary provider for every tenant in that building? Already? No. So it, um, I guess I have an example of like uh, the PNC building downtown. 
So since Night of Bell would be in that building, Spectrum would be in that building, CenturyLink is in that building. So like, each tenant could pick uh, whichever provider they had. Um, from a business standpoint, how, level three's market was, let's say in a building, they, there was an Edward Jones office. That Edward Jones office had to have level three or CenturyLink fiber, so they built it to the building, which made the other tenants have a different low cost option. Since they're already paying for the infrastructure. So their infrastructure is there. Is your infrastructure there also? I, I mean, I'm lost on this. Okay, yeah, let's work through this. Yeah, me too. Okay, so let's say, so there's 1,500 buildings in Ohio that have more than one tenant. One of those tenants bought CenturyLink as an internet provider at some point over the past 10 years. Okay. That would have been the old Time Warner Telecom company or Level 3 Communications that CenturyLink acquired both of those companies. So in that building, the fiber assets come to the DMARC in the building. And the reason that matters is because it's much lower cost because the infrastructure is already there. So there's no installation cost, not there will be any way, but they're able to lower the monthly recurring cost because it's more profitable for the, for the telecom company. Does that make sense? I guess Almost. maybe my confusion lies in with I'm used to the cable company running cable there and the phone company running phone lines there. They both come to the same building. And the internet providers are either on the cable or on the phone lines. Um, so ours and that's about it. Or the, but the fiber, yeah, or the fiber, but the fiber is usually from the phone company, in my experience. Uh, 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 Typically, that's the case. Um, it, it just the, the, the level three market, the level three built fiber into what those a thousand buildings already. So it's, so it's not the traditional phone company, not traditional cable provider. So do you have your own what COs around town? Does the like phone company has their own COs? And yeah. So the, we're it, talking about that last mile. Yeah. So at Pike Street, there's one in Blue Ash. It, it, uh, uh, could there be some sharing agreement out on the street? Potentially. Right. Okay. Okay. So your, your fiber is blue ash. Is it to a specific hub and then you go out from there or? Correct. So, but you're not in all the buildings in blue ash? Not in all the buildings in blue ash. All of the major. Um, your like major like your Lake Forest type offices yeah. were there, but in every building now. Do you think you find you're in the league of the township in Mason case? Um so in, in Mace in parts of Basin, CenturyLink actually is the local provider instead of CenturyLink. Um a few buildings in Liberty Township and Mason there's pretty there's pretty good coverage. But it's not necessarily that there has to be fiber in the building for CenturyLink to be an option for telecommunications just that's when we're the most cost effective. So, well, ultimately, what's going to have to happen is uh, you're going to have to look at the particular business's uh, geographic situation before you can make any type of valuation, right? I, I guess. Because there's no way for us to be able to know exactly where a close connection is or not without having a general map of uh, all major uh, intersections. Yeah. It, it, correct. It all has to be systematic. I, you know, I have an address. I look at the address. Right. Or, or, or like the Cincinnati Bell, the phone company, they have that Phi Optics product that they've built out in its uh, fiber to the nodes. So it's in different areas. And you might get full speed Phi Optics. You might not. Right. Because the level of service varies even among the particular system that's uh, in place. So ultimately what happens is if, uh, if we run into a customer that may want to uh, adjust what they have, we're going to have to contact you in order to find out whether or not that's a viable option to begin with. I, I, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I'm very upfront in that we can typically figure out within a couple of minutes right. whether or not I'm a good option, a bad option, or I can take a look at their bill and say you're at one, you should, you're this, this, this is not from. something that, in a, from our position, that uh, we would be able to determine. Correct. Uh, making the proper connection. 
connection. Correct. You'd have to make the connection, and we'd have to look at the spend and what the business use, use would be. Correct. And one thing we do is a little bit different than the cable or the local telephone companies. Everything we do is dedicated is a dedicated connection, meaning it'd be 10 megabits, I guess on the low end, 10 megabits upload and download as with a service level agreement. We're symmetric. Everything's symmetric. So there's no asymmetric where it's, they say it's a 200, 200 meg, but it's really 100 meg down if you run a speed test by 10 meg up. We do everything with a service level agreement because it's more of an enterprise grade solution rather than the consumer like at your house. So if we have an address, do you know, who, and it's not you guys that have that primary connection to that building, do you know whose it is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I have to check. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. But. <laughs> <laughs> like out yeah, here. So I'm going to you an address. <laughs> What's the address in? Let's see what we got. Yeah. What's the threshold yeah, where it makes sense for you to buy new fiber into a building? If they're spending, it, when you say when you say lay new fiber in a building, meaning no one's providing fiber? No. So it's a building that you're not in. What's the threshold where you say it's not worth it to go through Cincinnati Bell or Spectrum or whoever else may be in the building, and we're gonna we're gonna drop our own? Um, it would depend how close fiber is to the area. Like, it, for instance, if it's a building next door, they'll probably we'll look at bringing fiber in. That, that's our own. If it's 30 miles, we would always have that C-like agreement with the Cincinnati Bell or Spectrum, whichever is most cost effective. Pizza, Alan? Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, Brian.